Okay, so I'd like to thank the guests uh, first off, and uh, Marco Stromayer in particular for having me here today. Uh, thanks to you for being here so numerous. Um, I will give you uh, a quick run through uh, uh, a lot of work that we've done in the last five, six years uh, on measuring human interactions at the scale of the meters and the second. Um, so keep in mind that this is all behavioral stuff. So we are, we are, we are, when, whenever I will say social tie, social link, social network, I will mean a social graph where a link is behaviorally defined as close range proximity or face to face proximity of two individuals. Okay, so I know this is a mixed audience, so it's, it's really important to state this at the outset because what we mean by social link, if you talk to physicists, social scientists, can be, can be misleading otherwise. Okay, um, so keep in mind a uh, purely behavioral uh, approach. Um, what, 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 what we want to, to study in the context of the, of the work I will describe is really to try and follow individuals as they move in indoors environments or as they move in environments that we can somehow map and control and to study their individual interactions. Where an interaction, again, uh, I will use it interchangeably to mean a close range proximity and encounter in physical space. Okay? Um, and people have been tracking interactions in physical space for a long time for a number of reasons. Uh, this is important for infectious disease dynamics. It's, it's the same game that Dirk was speaking of, but played at the scale of indoor buildings, at the scale of individual hospitals, of individual schools, for example. Um, of course, there is computational social science on the table. There is organizational science. All the intersection between the social sciences and, and medicines, uh, health outcomes that are related to your social behavior. So you can think of mental health, and I will give a quick example about that. And then for, you know, for the more CS-oriented of you, there are all the location-aware services or the location-based uh, services, recommendation systems, and so on and so forth. And, and you may say, you know, like if you take a socio-physics uh, uh, perspective, that there's also an issue of trying to model and understand uh, how, what are minimal models of human behavior? How, do, how can we describe statistically how we move about in a situation such as this, how we contact each other. So there are a number of questions. The questions are not new themselves. Uh, and people have been tracking this kind of data for a very long time. This is a survey uh, by the University of Warwick, actually. Um, and this is what people in epidemiology normally use. So they, they ask at the end of the day to fill in a questionnaire or a contact diary, as they call it, like this, uh, where you're supposed to fill in who you have met, for how much time, whether there was physical contact, whether you had a conversation, when the encounter happened, uh, where, some kind of context, okay? So you're really trying to gather information about uh, not only the fact that contacts uh, uh, happened, but what, was the, what were the correlates of, of contacts, okay? And you see on the, on the right-hand side, you also have a sort of mini adjacency matrix where, where you are supposed to report the encounters of people that you know. So the structure, the local structure of your ego network, okay? This is all very standard stuff, and it's been used uh, for a long time to do very important stuff. Um, now what we have is uh, um, uh, electronic proxies for human behaviors, and they're not meant to replace what we were doing before, right? So this is a new proxy to quantify specific human behaviors that we can use to complement the information which has been uh, and is being collected by using standard means. Um, however, what, what's happening is that these kind of sensors are becoming basically dirt cheap. They are becoming basically disposable. Uh, you see that now in the industry you have a growing uh, wave of wearables. Uh, we will see only more of them. Uh, many of you have a mobile phone in your, in your pocket. Uh, and, and that's also a good proxy behaviorally, right? Because it means that somewhere in the, in the data stores of your mobile phone operator, there is a notion that we are in the same uh, room at the same time, right? So there is a, a notion implicitly described of an event, uh, a social event. So a lot of people have worked on this uh, starting 2006, 2007. You may know the pioneering work by Sandy Pentlat at the MIT uh, Media Lab on using sociometers. Uh, in that case, they were really going for full characterization of the social link. So they have accelerometers, uh, infrared, uh, proximity, in some cases you may have ultrasound proximity sensing, a lot of work in that direction. 
people very early on started using the Bluetooth connection of mobile phones to try and, and gauge close range proximity. The problem with that is that the, there is a huge heterogeneity in the radio chip of the phones, and typically you can assess only proximity with a resolution of tens of meters or more. The, the big problem of using Bluetooth is that probably if you, if you have an app that uses that here, it will be able to talk to the guys of the floor above you, right? So it's, it's a bit tricky, can be used. There are a number of studies, a very, very nice early work by Marcel Salaté in schools at Stanford. Uh, really cool work using the Intel MOTS, so yet another kind of, of device. Uh, there is an ongoing study funded by the CDC and University of Pittsburgh where they, they make school days, they go in a school and they try and measure everything out of that school for, uh, for 24 hours and then they get out and they randomize over different schools. Uh, work by Nathaniel Osgood, you may know and, and actually see a few of the people involved in the studies by the University of Kassel, Gerd Stummes, uh, group in uh, mostly the cooperator work, social gatherings. So, what we wanted to do back in 2007 when we started thinking about this stuff was can we map out human behavior in terms of a neat last vision? Can we, and it is a collection of maps, right? So can we create a map of high resolution social networks in schools, in conferences, in social gatherings, in museums to try and learn if we do this enough for long enough what are the robust observables, what are the statistical regularities, what actually depends on the context. The cool thing about having many maps is that you can start to abstract away some, some features. You, can, you, you learn what you will always observe, you learn what it depends on the context. So this is the vision that we wanted to execute. And in order to do that, we engineered our own device, which is a very simple device, which actually I've got one in my pocket right now. It's really small, you see. And, uh, and what these devices do basically is that you are supposed to wear them, uh, imagine, embedded in a conference badge or, uh, or pinned to your lapel uh, or in hospitals they get uh, seamed actually to the gowns of the, of the staff. And these devices talk to each other. So we don't use your position to compute your proximity because that is, that, that's usually affected by a strong error. What we do is that we let these devices talk to each other by using ultra low power radio frequency. In fact, so small that it doesn't go through your body. And this makes it so that you can also sense face-to-face uh, uh, <coughs> -face orientation. Okay? If you wear these devices embedded, in, you imagine, in your conference badge, unless you wear it like this, which some people do, uh, what happens is that they can only talk to each other if you're within one meter, one meter and a half, and facing each other. So it's really a proxy for a conversational interaction. It doesn't mean that you are actually having a conversation, but if you stand, you know, like in front of somebody else for one minute, and this is sustained, probably this is a strong correlate of a social interaction of some kind, okay? Uh, again, purely behavioral. This is what we measure, and, and we measure only this, okay? So out of this, we, we extract basically networks. Uh, recently, we, we evolved the, the system in such a way that we can store the data locally on the device. So we don't even need antennas in the environment. We can uh, let people stream out freely and still capture their, their interactions. And at the end of the day, after the fact, you collect the data and piece together a high resolution in terms of individual relations and time uh, social network. And so this is the data set that Marcus was actually speaking of. You are, you are somewhere there, I believe. Uh, this was back in 2009 uh, in uh, Torino, right? Yeah, at, uh, uh, at Villa Gualino. Right now, this is a situation frozen at the moment, uh, like a talk, uh, exactly a situation like this now. There is a speaker talking. You guys are mostly looking to me. You are very disciplined because actually among those guys, there were a few who were chatting and you see those pairwise interactions. Uh, this is not a specialized uh, visualization. So a point here is a person, two points are connected if those two guys are detected by the system in face-to-face -face proximity. And points gravitate towards the antenna that sees them the strongest, but don't trust the position, on, just, just look at the network. Don't, don't bother with the position in, in the plane of the dots. Uh, and then the coffee break arrives, uh, like it will arrive after my talk. And what happens is that you see that social interaction fire up and you start to see really people who get up, engage in discussion, and eventually, as you imagine, they all move towards the bar. It was an especially nice day, I think. Okay. And so you see, I, I cannot find Marcus actually, but he, you should be there. 
In this case, they were linked with Facebook, Twitter, a bunch of other metadata about people because we wanted to have access to the multiplex social network of interaction and try to understand how different social networks play out simultaneously. This is just to give you a sense of how we collect the data, why we collect the data, and how the data look like at a very cursory level. Then we started doing this over and over and over for the last six years. So what I will gi give you a summary about is really the, the, the work of six years, about 27 today, different experiments in 10 countries involving almost 60,000 persons as of today. Uh, here, what you see are mostly public health uh, uh, agencies that collaborate with us, or public health research institutes, because as you imagine, these data become very relevant uh, for infectious disease dynamics, for, uh, for infectious disease propagation, especially in hospitals where there is known to be a huge burden of, of um, uh, nosocomially transmitted uh, infections. Uh, we are also committing to sharing the data. We believe that you are not doing science if you don't share the data eventually. Uh, sharing this kind of data is tricky, but we are, you know, we are trying to work very hard to actually make this available to the public. So these are just a few data sets that you can uh, uh, download right away if you, if you visit that website. Um, I can anticipate that during the course of the coming month we'll release a couple of other very large data sets, fully time resolved uh, to the public. And our goal is really to create uh, on the one hand, uh, an open platform so that people can carry out uh, experiments and measure high resolution social networks uh, of their interest. On the other hand, we want to make available to the network science, to the computational social science community, a bunch of data set that you can go there and play with right away. Of course, with the caveat that these are data that are very specific, that they were captured at a very specific point in time, they describe a specific community, and so, you know, care should be taken. Um, and of course, as you imagine, this is something, I mean, I am speaking here, but this is the work of a lot of people. And so let me just thank Alain Barra, Andre Panisson, and Leticia Guan, who, who work with me at ISI on this. But as you imagine, there are a lot of people who are involved in these studies, and I don't have time to actually thank them all. Um, so let me give you a, a quick uh, look at how the data look like in a couple of contexts of interest. Uh, let's, let's take, for example, hospitals and schools because they are paradigmatic of different kind of interaction modality. Let's take hospitals, for example. Uh, in hospitals, I will skip over the pain that you have to go through in order to actually be able to use this kind of devices there. I mean, just imagine that you need to, you know, to package them, sterilize them, do this in a time such that the battery of the device doesn't run out while you're done. Uh, but the cool thing, if you, if you manage to do it, uh, and in this case we were able to do it early on uh, thanks to um, uh, Professor Abeto Tozzi at the uh, largest Italian children's hospital, the Bambino Gesù Hospital in Roma. In this case, what we did was to get this kind of map. And here you can clearly see that this is a role structure population. No? You see that you have uh, uh, different kind of roles for the... I will reconsider your offer to use a pointer. Thanks so much, Dirk. Thanks. So you see that you have auxiliaries, nurses, doctors, uh, you have children and patients. This hospital, this world in particular, treats uh, respiratory infections in the acute phase. So they only allow one parent uh, for every children. Uh, what you see here, as usual, is that the thickness of an edge uh, encodes somehow the strength of the tie, whereas the color encodes the temporal properties of the edge. So orange edges are very stable in time. Cyan edges are fluctuating in time. So what you see here is that uh, you have laid out in front of you the entire organizational structure of the world, basically, with the strong... Uh, constant ties between each children and the corresponding parent. You see that the nurses carry out a lot of coordination, they give orders to auxiliaries. Both of these classes of staff in the hospital innervate the network uh, between children and parent, right? Uh, these guys are considered uh, as, you know, like slaves, basically, by the doctors. Uh, and so the, the doctors never engage them directly. They typically go through nurses. You, you really see a lot of dynamics here. And what happens when, when you show this data to a hospital manager, typically, and this is interesting, is that somebody goes like, wow, this shouldn't happen. And then you can actually dig in the data and see that maybe there is, uh, you know, a smoking break you didn't know of that involves doctors, nurses, and auxiliaries, and is responsible for a specific click, a specific contact pattern in the structure, right? Uh, once you have the, this data, of course, you can do all, all sorts of, you know, network science-inspired, modeling-inspired studies, but the, the elephant in the room, the real big problem that you want to go after is 
cross mining this data with the standard surveillance for uh, multi drug resistant uh, organisms in the in the hospital you know hospitals are rather dangerous environments so you go there and you can pick up uh, one of these antibiotic resistant pathogens and this and these guys are responsible these bugs are responsible for a huge amount of uh, suffering and cost just to give you a sense of how big is this problem this is a direct cost uh, respectively to the uk health system and to the american health system yearly uh, of nosocomial infections so the name of the monster series mrsa mssa in general a number of, of uh, uh, pathogens uh, uh, that become antibiotic resistance because they evolve in the hospital environments in the presence of antiseptic, in the, in the presence of, uh, of, of an environment which fights them, and so they're especially uh, aggressive. Um, understanding how they propagate in a hospital is really an outstanding challenge right now. And so right now we are working with uh, uh, several hospitals, uh, both in the US and in Europe, to actually try and instrument a few words uh, uh, a few special intensive care units uh, so that we can track exactly the interactions between the nurses, the doctors, the patients and try and relate uh, the timing and the type and the appearance of different kind of, uh, of infections. Okay? Uh, so I'll just give you a sense of how you do this. I will not go into the details because you really need to get dirty with the biology. Biology is super dirty. Um, so this is, for example, a proof of concept study we did in uh, geriatric unit in, uh, in Lyon. And in this case, you see what we have is for 12 days, we have the high resolution social network, each and every encounter that happened in that world, together with daily biological evidence of the presence or lack thereof of colonization by uh, an antibiotic resistant organism. So what you have to do every day is that you go around, uh, you have to put a Q-tip in the nose of everybody, and then uh, you have to sequence the stuff, uh, check what is there uh, in terms of pathogens, uh, amplify that by using PCR, and, and you get these maps where basically you can start to zoom in on specific transmission, individual transmission events. So for example, here you can see that there is this nurse, she was healthy, then she had uh, a bunch of contacts with uh, a number of patients that all got um, uh, PCR confirmed, uh, genetically confirmed uh, influenza. And, and after a while, she, she develops the symptoms here and then she becomes also positive a couple of days after to the pathogen. So is this a smoking gun for transmission? No, because we are not tracking these guys outside of the hospital, right? So we cannot exclude that she picked up the, the flu on the, on when she was off duty on these days, right? But this is just to give you a sense of where we want to go, what, what, is, what is an outstanding challenge, right? Really fusing together high resolution behavioral data on social contact in hospitals together with the dynamics of the pathogen. And, and then trying to cross mine them by using tools from statistics and machine learning in order to zoom in on the determinants of transmission, and hopefully then do something about that. Eventually, you want to do interventions. You want to affect changes in this environment that improve the outcomes, right? So you could redesign the shift of the nurses, redesign the cohorting of patients, and, and so on and so forth. And you can also do you know, nice plots where you show uh, what are the contacts between staff uh, and what are the contacts that are likely to have spread an actual pathogen, okay? So you can develop analytics that an hospital manager can then use to take decisions in these environments. This is just to give you a sense of a hospital. Then, from now on, I will speak of schools. Uh, for, first off, because they're less dramatic than this. Uh, second, because they're really nice, because schools really entwine, uh, and, and ter uh, schools really have an interesting mix uh, of uh, a top-down behavior, people moving around and doing whatever they want, and, the, and sorry, that, that was the bottom-up part, and the top-down uh, schedule. You have to be in this class at this point in time. You have multi-resolution uh, uh, structures. You have cliques of friends, uh, you have classes, uh, you have larger structure due to social events that are scheduled. So there is a lot of complexity, both structural in the time, and it's very interesting to study by using this kind of uh, technological proxies. So this is, for example, a school in Lyon. This was taken in 2009. Um, and here what you see is that you have individual classes, uh, the dot at the center is the teacher, and you see when, when the movie starts, uh, you see we have, uh, uh, maybe you don't see, when the movie starts, you see some of the classes are engaged in social activities, so you have a lot of contacts, in this case, for example, this might be a class going on, again, with the teacher speaking and a few kids 
uh, chatting. Uh, then what happens is that there are specific points in time, uh, here you see time running, uh, where you have this, uh, this global uh, connectivity pattern arising, and it is due to the fact that all the children are moving to the cafeteria and they're having lunch uh, together, okay? So what you see here is a mix of uh, um, uh, microscopic activity of the kids, uh, uh, shaped uh, by globally and externally decided uh, activity pattern, uh, which is imposed on them, right? They have to be in this, uh, in this class at this point in time. And of course, you can project away time. This is, for example, the biggest study that we did in school in collaboration with Gabriel Leung in Hong Kong. This is uh, 1,000 persons for a couple of weeks. Um, of course, you, you have communities that emerge in the network structure that correspond to classes. The standard thing that an epidemiologist, an epidemiologist uh, would do was, would be to project away the individuals, to think in terms of contact matrices, so to coarse grain according to a specific structure that you know it's important, the, the class of the school, and then just create a matrix like this uh, where a given entry corresponds to the median time of contact between the guys in second A and the guys in second B, for example. So you are erasing information. Uh, and then all of this uh, is, uh, uh, is, in, is entwined uh, with the trajectories. So you have groups, but you have their mobility over time. Here, for example, again, this is teased out of the raw data. You have different spaces in the school, and you see what different groups of people do. You see, the, for example, that they take turns in using the cafeteria, whereas these guys have lunch, these guys are in the playground. When these guys are done, they swap places. So there, there is really a lot of, of complexity to this data. So the point is, can we, are we going to do only data mining? And of course not. I mean, there are a number of uh, uh, problems that are well established to which this data can provide uh, new questions and, and new answers, hopefully. So for example, you can think of gender uh, homophily in uh, uh, in a school setting. This is uh, a topic that has received a lot of attention. There's a huge amount of literature. Those of you who have a background in sociology know better than me. And in this case, you see, if you project away time in the, in the school data I was showing you, what you see is that kids that are very young mix relatively regardless of gender, but as they age, you see that they seem to separate, right? So you can, uh, this is before puberty. So of course, you know, then, then things of course change. Um, so you can try to quantify this. You can define a standard uh, uh, same gender uh, preference index, which is just the fraction of egos neighbors who, has, who have the same gender as you. And then what you can do is study this in the network compared to a suitable null model. And what you find is that, I will make a long story short, uh, that of course there is gender homophily, of course it evolves its age, this is known. But then, because these data are really high resolution, you can start asking more refined questions. You can ask, okay, I know there is homophily, I know it evolves with age, but does this evolution with age depend on gender? Uh, does it depend on tie strength, where tie strength is defined as the cumulative time in interaction that two given subjects may have? And, and by looking at this data, actually, you can, uh, you can go deeper and, uh, and answer some of these questions, which are more refined versions of questions that have been in the social sciences uh, for, for quite a long time, right? So, for example, uh, just to give you a sense of this, uh, I, will, I will need to take some time on this because there is a lot of information here. Uh, what we are plotting here is the following thing. We are considering the aggregated social network of interaction projecting away time. So now we have a static network where a, a node is a person, two nodes are connected with an edge whose weight is how much time me and Marcus spend in face-to-face uh, -face proximity, okay? Then you can threshold this network by using this threshold here. You see this is a time. And at, at any given point in time, what I'm doing is considering only links in excess of the threshold, okay? So here I'm retaining only the long-lasting contacts, here I'm retaining, if, I, if I'm here, I'm only retaining, I'm retaining all the contacts, so also the weak contacts. So here you have weak ties and strong ties equally. Here you have only the strong ties, okay? Uh, this is just a filter on the, on, the, on the network weights. Then what you have here is the person correlation coefficient between the age of a children and the same gender preference index. So what you see is the following thing. You see that if you look at strong ties, you can see that you have 
gender homophily, both for boys and for girls, and gender homophily correlates with age. So you get more homophilic gender-wise the more you age. Okay? So this confirms the intuition that you have from the picture, right? That as they age, you have this segregation and more homophilic behavior. But now this is what you see, what's cool, is actually what happens if you move to this side of the plot, where you start including all the weak ties, which outnumber actually the strong ties. And what, and what you see here is, first, you see a different behavior between boys and girls. And this is already interesting. This is something that otherwise you cannot see. Uh, the cool thing is that this was actually theorized by Tom Schneiders, uh, and uh, there, there's a transcription of a, of a talk he gave uh, where he actually said, well, you know, if we had the eye of God, maybe we would see this effect. And actually the effect, uh, if you use uh, uh, wearable sensors, is, becomes visible. The second thing is that you see the effect change is signed for boys and for girls. And what this is telling you is that as they age, uh, girls uh, become more homophilic for the strong ties, uh, so they tend to spend more time, uh, they tend to focus, sorry, the, the, the strong ties on girls, and more so as they age, but they unfold the network of weak ties to the boys, okay? Whereas the guys, being very simple as we are, they go like boys, boys, boys all the time, okay? So what you see basically is that there is a nuanced behavior uh, as it relates to age-dependent uh, uh, gender homophily, and this can be teased apart uh, by, by using this kind of high-resolution data, right? But you need to get, you see, down to the level of interaction that lasts a couple of minutes, which normally do not get reported in, uh, in survey results or in interviews. There is a strong recall bias towards long-lasting interactions. Um, another example, uh, this is recent work done with Mark Pashuki uh, at the University of California, San Francisco, and then the Mongan Institute for Public Health. Uh, in this case, we were again in a school, uh, and we were interested in measuring how the structure of the social network, how socialization behavior of, uh, of children relates to mental health. And to assess mental health, we deployed standard questionnaires, the Childhood Depression Index uh, uh, and the Self-Esteem uh, Questionnaire. So we, are, we have a mix of self-reported information from the, from the subject, from the children, and behavioral information as it relates to their social uh, ties. Uh, in this case, the study was, uh, was aimed at understanding whether, what are the correlates uh, to uh, healthy eating behaviors and uh, healthy movement in the, in the school setting. So the, the, uh, the subjects were equipped with wearable sensors for the proximity, with Fitbit-like devices to measure their mobility in space, and we are deploying uh, questionnaires. So the way the data look is like this. Uh, the study unfolded over three months. In every month, we had three days uh, separated by about 10 days where we were collecting, uh, we were measuring the social network. Uh, and so this is first month, second month, third month. And then what you can do is start to see how the social network shapes uh, and how features related to depression or self-esteem evolve and what correlates are there with respect to the structure of the social network. And I will skip the boring table but, but the result uh, is that, for example, we, we find that there is, uh, uh, contrary to what has been uh, hypothesized, uh, in our data at least, the social influence does not seem to shape your likelihood of getting uh, uh, a depressive behavior. Uh, we see that for, for girls, uh, uh, depressive symptoms are strongly correlated for, with lack of sociality, as, as measured by mobility and proximity in space to other people, not so much with, with boys. Uh, and in general, we find very strong signals of uh, very strong correlations between uh, health outcomes, mental health outcomes in this setting, and the social behavior, which can be measured by using wearable sensors. Okay? Any questions on this point? Uh, I'm happy to be interrupted. Huh? So if you have any, any issues, if I was unclear on any point, please interrupt me. Otherwise, I will just go on with another twist. Okay. So in all of this, you have seen you have a, a very nice, a very high resolution data source which you can use to um, surface new questions or to answer new forms of the old questions. Uh, but one big problem in general is how much detail of this data do we need to retain to address a given problem. Having more data is typically a disaster. 
okay? Because it means that your models, as, as, as Dirk was, was mentioning, become more complex. Uh, it's harder to parameterize things. Uh, so there is really a place for the very simple representations that the epidemiologists use, because there are ways of erasing information. Ideally, you want to erase all the information that doesn't matter, and only keep the information that matters to your problem. Okay? So in general, we have, on the one hand, uh, a high resolution social network which is highly detailed uh, but it's also highly specific. It captures a lot of specific features, spurious features of the context where it was measured. Uh, it captures noise, of course. This is the standard if you want, you know, uh, approximation generalization problem that you always face in statistics. On the other hand, you may design uh, very simple, hopefully more generalizable representations of the high resolution social network data but typically, which representation is most suitable to a given problem at hand? And the choice of the data representation is not neutral, and, and we have to be very careful about how to represent this data in order to then embed them into computational frameworks. Uh, the, the kind of heterogeneities that you have on this data uh, is absurd. You have them all, basically. Uh, we know that human dynamics is sparsity. So for example, if you take intercontact times, duration of contacts, they're all highly non-Poissonian, fat tails all over the place. Uh, there is, uh, topologically, of course, you have the heterogeneity, which is known. You have uh, huge heterogeneity in the distribution of weights, of the times that people uh, spend together. Uh, plus, you have all the complexity of the fact that these networks are not free. They live constrained by daily rhythms, weekly rhythms, organizational rhythms, and so on and so forth. Uh, you have all sorts of strange weight topology, topology activity correlations, and you also have uh, uh, especially complex features. Uh, you, uh, think of schools, for example, where you have classes. Uh, when they go have lunch together, what happens is that all the edges between these classi classes flash up uh, together. Okay? So you have groups of edges that have strongly correlated temporal behavior. And this stuff is very hard to capture with the standard model that people use in, uh, uh, in, in network science, but it's important. So these kind of things, you see? And what you can see, and here you have a couple of references, is that if you try to model an epidemic on this network and disregard this, you take into account the communities, you take into account the weak ties, you take into account the distribution of weights, of contacts, and so on and so forth. Still, if you fail to model these weak structures, you're doing a pretty poor job at approximating and understanding how an epidemic unfolds over this network. So this is really a challenge. And because of this, there's, there's a lot of ongoing work on trying to reason about the data representation of high resolution social networks. So this is a very non-scientific diagram where on the horizontal axis you have how much structural detail you are retaining about your, orig your original data. And on the vertical axis, how much temporal detail you are retaining. So up here, you have the empirical data as they come from sensors, right? You have a lot of structural detail, a lot of temporal detail, and you're also capturing a lot of noise. Down here, you have what people uh, would call homogeneous mixing scenario, a fully connected graph where all the interactions are unweighted or have the same weight. And typically, the interesting stuff is somewhere in the middle, right? So there has been a lot of work in the network science community to try and understand the role of temporal aggregation, of projecting away time. Instead of working on a time-resolved network, we try to aggregate it into a static network, and hopefully that will behave like the original one. The answer is, in general, no. But th there's a lot of work on this. There's work of us, work by the group of uh, Peter Holm, Frank Schweitzer, uh, and a bunch of other people, really. Um, then there is also work on uh, what you can do in terms of coarse graining these structures by forgetting about the individual. In all of these cases, you're retaining the individual and you're projecting away time. Here, what you're doing, if you move in this direction, is that you're losing structural detail, so you're forgetting about the individual, and you're retaining, hopefully, more of the temporal dynamics, right? And here, there has been little less work. In general, the problem is the following. If you, are, if you are in an hospital, uh, there is a guide to coarse graining the community. This is a community which people call a role structured population, where every person is either a patient, a nurse, a doctor, uh, and so on. In schools, you have the classes, so you have a special component of the organization, which again guides aggregation, because you have to be in that class. And there is a class label associated to every kid, right? You cannot pick your class at random every morning. Uh, but in the general case, if you have this data, 
there is no such class distinction. And one of the questions that uh, we're very interested in uh, exploring at this point in time is really, can we let the data guide us in terms of what are the proper behavioral classes that we should consider when summarizing the structure of the network, when coarse-graining this data and trying to come up with a simpler representation. Uh, and for this, we use machine learning schemes. We use unsupervised uh, machine learning schemes. Uh, or if you want, we use fancy statistical inference uh, frameworks. And, and the basic idea is to let the data guide you in telling what are the, the relevant uh, partitions. Uh, and I will give you an example of stuff that we have done recently in this, uh, in this domain in the, in the next slide. 10 minutes, uh, how am I going with time? Five minutes. five minutes, okay, then five minutes. Um, so one thing you can do is the following. Uh, these are, remember, these are time varying, uh, people call them temporal uh, social networks, right? So what you can do is represent them as a tensor, as a three mode tensor. Imagine that the state of the network at a given point in time is represented by an adjacency matrix where if there is a link between me and Marcus in the corresponding matrix element, you have a one, but then this evolves in time. So the frontal slices of the tensor encode the state of the social network at different points in time, okay? Uh, if you're interested in this kind of representation, there is this nice review by Mario de Domenico, Yamir Moreno, and others. And then there is a very old result uh, due to Kruskal that tells you that given a tensor like this, you can always, this is a theorem, decompose it as a sum of terms uh, that are the product, uh, the outer product of three vectors. Uh, and, and you need to use uh, as many terms as the rank of the original tensor. And this provides the key for an approximation mechanism, which is commonly used uh, in, uh, in, in computer science and especially in applied context, uh, which is a low rank, a low dimensional approximation of the original data. So what you do is the following. You, you take your original tensor and you force a representation of this tensor as the sum of an R of R terms uh, where you decide R. Okay, so if you keep R very large, then you're giving the model a lot of freedom. If you're keeping R low, then you're giving the model very little freedom. Then what you have to resolve is basically this minimization problem where you minimize the Frobenius norm, which is the difference between the original data, the original uh, temporal network, and your approximation. Okay, so it's the original data minus the sum of R terms. Uh, and this can be solved under, mm, under constraints on non-negativity for all these vectors, okay? Non-negativity is cool um, because it allows you to get a decomposition which is very human readable. Because what happens is that your final network will be the sum of different parts. It's not like SVD or, or representations that are non-constrained to be non-negative, which give you a complex uh, interference patterns of positive and negative terms sometimes, which doesn't become very interpretable. This allows you to get, and, and in practice, uh, it's been known to, to provide, uh, especially in, um, in computer vision, uh, very human readable parts, okay? Parts representation. Then, of course, the symmetry of the frontal slices, uh, you remember, this is an undirected network. The symmetry of the frontal slices makes it so, sorry, that two of these matrices are pretty much the same, they're equal because of symmetry. And then you end up with two matrices. Uh, both of them have one, uh, have columns that, uh, uh, that are the, the components of the decomposition. So if you have, if you have set R components, is there a question? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would call it activity patterns uh, because they're not motive conveys an idea of locality and, and these things can be... For example, what component is uh, link A, B, e, B, e, B, uh, C? Correct, correct. So basically what this decomposition gives you is that you have the columns are the R components that you set. So you're free to choose how many columns you have in these matrices. And then the rows here are the nodes of the network and the rows here are the time intervals of your system. And so what you're learning is that a component is a group of nodes, a weighted group of nodes, and their activity patterns collectively over time. So you're learning simultaneously from the data the groupings of the nodes and the way they act in that form over time. So you may call this uh, an activity pattern or a temporal motif. It's actually a mix of a community structure and activity patterns, right? Simultaneously resolved. And so if you... If you do this, I will skip the example, you need 
you need a strategy to set the complexity of the model, to set uh, uh, how many components you need to use. Uh, and I will not go into the details. There are a number of techniques, uh, one in particular called core, con core, core consistency that you can use. But basically, the strategy is that you start from a temporal network. Oh, OK. And you represent it as a tensor. Then you factorize it by optimizing a quality metric that tells you when you should stop in terms of model complexity. And after you've done that, the output of this decomposition is basically, on the one hand, a matrix that will tell you which nodes belong to which component. And on the other hand, a set of activity profiles, each of which describes the activity in time of one of these components. Okay? So in this case, if you run this, for example, on the school data, what you find is that you find all the classes. That was easy. Even standard community detection on the aggregated network would have yielded that. Okay? But you also find components that are not classes. You see this component, for example, mixes third A and third B. And this is a social event that involves those two, those two classes of that grade. Okay? So you are learning a parts-based representation of your temporal network that exposes the community structure and the activity patterns over time. And you see, for example, that for classes, uh, you have uh, spikes uh, when there is class time, whereas for these social events, you tend to have spikes during the, the lunches or the, or the breaks and so on. And, and the cool thing is that then you can validate this. In our, uh, in our data, what we have is that we have external metadata independently collected that allows us to validate these structures and make sure that the stuff we get from the tensorial decomposition actually matches stuff that we know exists in the data. Okay? Uh, then the last step in the last minute that, uh, that I have is can we use these kind of structures uh, to then act, to then plan an intervention on the system. So which of these structures is, for example, most relevant for the spread of influenza-like pathogen in the school? In order to do this, what you do is that you leverage the non-negativity of the representation. So what you do is that you start from this decomposition, where you have nodes and, uh, and components, and you implement the following scheme. Oops, I'm sorry. And you implement the following scheme. You start from the original data. You represent it as a tensor. You get the factor matrices. And then you decide, OK, let's imagine that I remove this social event, this lunch break, for example. You zero out that term in the component representation. And then you can go backwards. You can reassemble the tensor and reconstruct a, a, a social network, which is now deprived of that social event. Okay? So this provides you a way of figuring out activity patterns in there, erasing them, and reassembling the data. And then what you can do is couple, in both cases, the network, the temporal network, with the dynamical processes, for example, an epidemic process on top of that, and compare how things unfold in the two scenarios. And by doing this, you are learning to rank components with respect to their importance for spreading of a, of a pathogen. Right? And if you do this, I will, I will just stop here. What you see is that uh, uh, is what you expect somehow. You see that some of these components, and not the classes, this is interesting, are responsible for a huge delay in the spreading of an epidemic if you remove them. Here what I'm plotting is the delay ratio of an epidemic in the altered network vs the original network on removal of this component. And you see that removing the classes doesn't really change a lot, but removing some of these uh, uh, social events uh, uh, actually delays the epidemic significantly. So this is just you know, an example tied to the specific case of infectious disease dynamics uh, and, uh, and to the specific case of a school data set. But in general, the, the, the point I wanted to highlight is that we are in a position where we can, use, we can combine network science methods with machine learning techniques uh, in order to actually reason on high resolution social network and really unmount them, really take them apart into pieces, reassemble them, and start in simulation. Uh, what happens. And I will stop here and thanks so much for your attention and, uh, and thanks to thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Giro, for a very interesting talk. Uh, there's time for questions now. Yes. About the, um, 
the removing of the, the less important pattern motif, no? the like temporal motif, sorry. Um, because uh, when you work with uh, particles, they are all uh, of the same characteristic. But when uh, we are speaking about uh, people, uh, the complexity, you don't know, for example, if uh, you remove <laughs> the motif of the infect node. So it's very... Uh, I'm not sure you get your question. It's... Suppose that you remove a, 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 one, a, a few, one motif that appears a few times. Appear, uh, it's, no more, no, it's no important. But in, if you are studying the infection and do, you remove this node, the node that starts the infection because oh, we are speaking about people and no particles in this case, mm -hmm. Well, in general, yeah. um, there is an intrinsic uh, complexity in oh, yeah. each one of the nodes now. Sure, sure. But, um, you know, the, the good thing when you think about infectious disease dynamics is that the virus of influenza doesn't care much about your complexity. Uh, you, you're, you're going to be infected uh, if you're susceptible with pretty much the same probability. Then, of course, you know, you have people who are super spreaders, you have people who are uh, um, immune. Uh, one, of, one of the problems that we will be able to tell you in modeling um, flu-like disease spread uh, is that you don't know what fraction of your population is actually immune because of previous immunization, because of cross-immunity from previous infections. So that's absolutely true. The angle here of removal, however, is not an angle which is aimed at uh, controlling or mitigating an epidemic by removing the guy responsible for it. The, the idea is really to make the network as a whole more robust by re-engineering some structural property of the network as a whole, right? So for example, in hospitals, the standard thing that you think of is can I rearrange the structure of the shifts so that the same quality of care is given to the patients, but the structure of the interaction network that arises because of the shifts is more resilient to invasion by a pathogen. So it's really a perspective where you, you do consider people as, as atoms because that's, that's what they look like from the point of view of, a, of an infectious disease agent, typically. Of course, you are disregarding some heterogeneity, um, and, and, and there you're right. Um, but this is a standard population approach. This is really, in fact, I would say that the interesting thing about reasoning at this level is that you're, you're sort of doing some mesoscale network science, right? This is not about motives. It's not really about my feature as a node and my, my ego network. It's not about the community structure as a whole. It's some intermediate level where I have uh, soft partitions of the network and uh, temporal activity patterns, and I'm trying to reason in terms of what I can do in terms of uh, optimizing that. So I, I hope this sort of answers your question. Uh, I just have a small informational uh, question. Maybe I missed it. Uh, how do you measure exactly uh, a network tie between two entities? It's by this batch methods exclusively by in this uh, case it's uh, batches uh, yes also. yeah that's a and and it, uh, how do you measure a network the network tie between time two, yes the tie between two units of people actors or whatsoever type you say the link the link the link between, the link between. okay uh, to yeah ah, tie yeah 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 just by the batches. just by using yeah yeah just by the batches okay. correct that, that's why i stress in that this is a in all of them. That's why I stress that this is purely behavioral approach, right? Of course, it doesn't mean that you cannot have other data about those guys. But uh, <clears throat> yes, that's one problem. And another problem is uh, the intensity mm -hmm. of a link. Sure. Say, uh, if some people just encounter, mm -hmm. and then there is a network link, Yes. But even if what? they don't talk to each other? Absolutely. Just mm -hmm. if they encounter Correct. This is purely behavioral, so the network uh, describes uh, one behavior, and the behavior is close-range proximity. Whether you're talking or not, I cannot measure. I mean, if, if you, in a sense, you don't care, right? If they are all in an elevator, so they all yeah. have uh, network links. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Absolutely. Distinction between intensity or things like well, that? Well, there is a distinction of the intensity because we are sensitive to face to face proximity and we are measuring, we have a clock running that tells us how much each interaction lasts. 
in oh, time, yeah, right? Okay. So that you have. But then if you were, you know, just uh, looking into each other's eyes uh, or uh, shaking but hands then, uh, or, uh, or having a wonderful yeah, conversation, then, uh, it's something we cannot measure. If there are 10 people together in an elevator mm -hmm. for a long ride, right. uh, then they have a, a yeah. very intense network ties. Correct. And if you are, you know, and, and that's a situation where if you are a pathogen, you are likely to jump on those other guys, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So it makes sense that it is so. Uh, th that's, why, that's why it's important to state what kind of network this is, right? Yeah. So if, if you're asking me, is this a good network to model uh, information spread? No, of course not. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, it may be in some context, but in, in general it is not, right? Um, so it's, it's really one of the behaviors, and typically what you have and what ideally you would like to have is the multiplex of, of the networks that are relevant to your process, right? So maybe there is the face-to-face -face interaction, your interaction by mail, uh, your interaction on Facebook, and so on and so forth, right? Maybe the next step you may uh, uh, put to the batch uh, uh, video camera or something like that. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> we, we, we did this actually in, um, in schools in order to validate the data. So we had to go through the very painful job of having a camera in a corner and then having people manually annotate uh, each and every contact and then compare that with the system, right? Because the system will give you something, but, but you need to make sure that, that it gives you something you understand. Uh, in all the other contexts, as you imagine, privacy concerns make cameras uh, unsuitable, especially in hospitals. And, and I, I actually, thanks for the question, because it's important to add that in all of these studies, uh, the, the in each and every individual consent, consented in writing to, to, to having the data collection go on. So we have informed consent and paper trail for each and every person that you see in, uh, in those data sets, which is a huge amount of work, uh, but it's really, it's really needed. All of these studies are purely opt-in. So we, we don't include people by default. Um, okay. Um, so my question is about the second part of your talk. So mm -hmm. you, you showed this example um, from the school in San Francisco where you looked at the relation between um, interactions and well-being, right? Or, sure. Um, psychological well-being and the setting was a lunchtime setting right so I was just curious whether there is also data on what you know kind of food choices people made because there is all mm -hmm. this work on you know that there would be differences whether you know females and males would have lunch together or whether it's just a female group mm -hmm. or just a male group so did you I mean look also into that or do you have any data on that um, how this uh, kind of the data are there uh, because we had observers in the, in the cafeteria, so we have their annotations. So we didn't, we didn't use them in this study, um, and probably will not use them at all because we do have a few concerns about uh, the data protection. The, the IRB that we, that we had to run through, this was in a US setting, so this went through an IRB, and the, um, the IRB was sort of uh, placed on us a lot of constraints when we are, if, if we are to use this kind of data. So I'm not sure we'll ever use it, but, but the data are there in principle. And it's, uh, it's possible that Emil Ozer and Mark Pashuki actually use those data. Uh, I doubt we'll be able to cross them with the, with the network, uh, with the social network uh, data, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's a long story. But as you imagine, when it comes to data protection, there are different types of behavior that are covered by different types of um, of regulations and that one was one of the tricky ones to actually uh, log and use scientifically. Okay, uh, thank you very much again, Giro, uh, for your talk. Thanks to you.